Would you like to, do you want to All right. stay seated or do you want well, to the floor? Well, I'll stand as long as I'm able to and then I'll sit down. Uh, okay. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to come here and talk to you about my art. Um, I haven't done this very often. Um, and what I'm going to talk about, what I'm going to say, is only my experience. Not, I don't represent any school of thought or any uh, artistic attitude. Um, I represent only what I think I know. And a great deal of what I do and think I'm doing, I don't know why I do it. <laughs> No, that's, that's true. Uh, I think they say 85% of people's uh, thoughts are subconscious, and I'm a great believer in the mind and the psychology and the subconscious. So you may disagree with what I'm saying uh, in part or totally, and um, you may be right and I may be wrong. I mean, I just, I don't know. But, um, <laughs> Let me um, start by telling you my background. I, was, um, I came from a home in which art was about as low on the totem pole as it could be. My family felt that artists were, you know what. And uh, I had a, an uncle who was a cellist with the Cleveland Orchestra, and he was regarded as, you know, hardly should be allowed in the front door. Of course, the fact that he uh, was a, a wonderful cellist and had studied and had perfected his art to a very high degree held no value in the family, in my particular part of the family. Um, I went to uh, college, uh, a liberal arts college. I probably, as many of you would probably realize for yourselves, you may, you may not have gone at the right time. You perhaps were not ready to uh, profit from what was available. Today, I guess the young people are more uh, serious. I was not a serious student. I made it through, but uh, barely. And uh, I, I uh, then went to graduate school uh, to be a teacher, not an art teacher, but a teach public school, uh, junior high school teacher of English and social studies. And then later um, I went on to get a doctor's degree uh, at Columbia Teachers College. And um, one of the courses I took focused on the family as educator. And the focus of the um, class, and I, and I came to believe it for myself, is that most people will never have a teacher as important as a mother or father. That's in my, I, I believe that. That's one of the few things I'm pretty sure about. Um, and I think about this art center and how lucky you are to have this art center and how lucky the young people and the older people are to have a place where they can come and express themselves and feel free, I hope, to uh, work out their artistic ideas. If a parent or if a home or if the, both parents or if, however many people are there for the young person, if they don't make the young person feel that what he loves or what he seems to have an aptitude for, if that is not important, the person ultimately may be able to succeed in that field or in a related field, but it's gonna be 10 times harder. How much nicer it is to have people at home who say, geez, I, I, I can't put one foot in front of the other, but you wanna be a ballet dancer, 
go for it, you know? Very often it happens that there's an incompatibility between the interests of the parents. Maybe the parents are very active and the kid is, just likes to be Ferdinand and sit there and smell the flowers. You know, that's a bad, that's a bad uh, relationship, which is nobody's fault. It's just not a good mixture. So if the parents or the caregivers uh, can make the young person feel that what he or she um, cares about, the parents are supportive. That they, that they may not be for us, may not be what I would want to do, but gosh, if you like it, that's good enough for me. So I think that's very, very important. And um, I, I never went to art school, and I, in a way, wish I had uh, tried art school. RISD, of course, is one of the great art schools in the world. I don't know what I would have, how I would have done there, you know, whether I don't know, I've never been there. I don't know what they uh, require of you or what they let you do that you uh, may not be right within the curriculum. I probably would have learned a lot of things that I had to learn for myself. At the same time, I probably was fortunate in that I never had anybody say to me, oh, you can't do this or you can't do that. I just did it because I don't like to be told what to do. And uh, people say, well, I don't like that picture. Or that's sort of like other subjects in my attitude as well. You don't have to do it if you don't want to do it. You know, okay. But as I said, I'm only uh, speaking for myself tonight. This is just how it seems to me. And you, your experiences may be quite different than mine. And, and it makes no sense to you. And, Perhaps that you're wiser than I am. Um, I thought that what I could do, for example, um, up here, when it comes, well, maybe we can use something a little stronger. I thought about this. I have, I'm a great insomniac. <laughs> and I think of these, I was, I've thought of this uh, talk many times, well, from 2 to 3, 3 to 4 a.m., and you name it, I, I've thought of it many times. Now, those of you who aren't upset about getting your hands dirty and I'm very sympathetic to people who say, ooh, I can't touch that, that's dirty or that's messy or something. Um, if we've got, we'll call this A, B, I thought of this too, C. I'll show you I know my alphabet. <laughs> now, anybody who cares to come up and make a mark of any sort in any of those squares, I'm gonna give the chalk to anybody. It doesn't bite, any come up here, I mean. <laughs> take that, or you wanna take a different, different color here? <laughs> Anywhere, it's up to you, you're the boss. Any, any. We don't have rules about that. Or just a single mark, and it doesn't matter. Now if those don't work, that's, don't blame me for that. Uh-oh. Gave out, huh, that one did. And these chalks are good. No good. Those are not mine. You can get one out of it. I can put it down there. Right?
Maybe that one's no good. This one's, this one's good here. Better get permission from the. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> now, what we have here are six different uh, beginnings of pictures. And what, what we should all find interesting is why the given individuals made the particular marks that they did. Um, I don't know. And maybe the people who made those marks know, maybe they don't know. But you can see that people approach a similar situation very, very differently. And those marks are a reflection, although we may not be able to articulate what's going on, is a reflection of what each one of those individuals felt like doing at that moment. And I think it's perfectly understandable that everybody would make a different sort of a mark. So when I begin a picture, I have a piece of paper, one of these pieces of paper here, and as I said earlier, you can stand in front of that paper till the cows come home just looking at the beautiful piece of paper, which is those of you who are not frightened or may touch any of the pieces of paper you want because uh, you may, if you want to. You can stand in front of that piece of paper for as long as you want and just sort of think about what you're going to do. But finally, finally, you have to well, we'll, we'll take this off here. We'll put this here somewhere. Oh, we can put it here. Do you want me to take it? No, that's all right. We can just... Finally, you have to start somewhere, right? You, or you can just stand here forever. <laughs> Finally, you have to, where do I want to make that mark? Do I want to make it this way? Do I want to make it here? Finally, you get bold and you say, all right, there it is. Now. What does that mark? That mark does two things. It opens up a lot of possibilities for you, but it also has eliminated a tremendous number of possibilities. For example, I was thinking, why do I make borders around most of my pictures? Why do I do that? What's the difference between a picture with a border and a picture without a border? Does anybody have any feeling about that? There's no right or wrong. Does, the border for me sometimes says that's the, end of the, that's the end of the picture. Now you could run it out to the edge of the paper and that would be the end of it too. But, well, I don't know why I make borders very often. But once you, once you make... Does it somehow hmm? set your focus? Pardon? Does it somehow set your focus? Having a border? Well, if you make a border, you try to stay within that border, right? right? Yeah. I think it gives you, that definitely gives you some comfort, though, because you sort of know where, where your vision ended. Well, God knows I need, I need comfort. I mean, I, need. <laughs> I think it, it gives me comfort. <laughs> Good. Well, all right. So you have, you have one mark, and then you may, you may say, well, let's see. 
gee, what story does that, that tells a totally different story, doesn't it? I mean that, if you look at the difference between the implications of that or that, very different, I think. Doesn't mean we're home free, but we're, we're in a slightly different mess this way and this way, right? So you, you say, well, this part of the picture is sort of provided for, not totally, but we've made a commitment here. Where do we want to go? Where do I want to go now? Well, maybe since this is sort of slanting, I may say, well, I'm going to run one just very definitely up and down. This is sort of a slash. This will be a much more deliberate line. Then we'll turn it around. Gee, that's, yeah, that's, that's telling us something, doesn't like that. Now, can you see how that's really trying to tell a different story? Um, can everybody see? So what do you, what do, you do? You have, you have this area here, for sure, and you have this area here. You've sort of done something to this central part here. Now, I wouldn't, I don't think I'd make a mark across, I don't think I'd do that. that you know why that's sort of, that's sort of, is making this out of bounds, right? You've already said in a way, ah, you're an outside, this, this part here is an outsider <laughs> looking in, and I, I, want to, I don't want to do that. Or, then you say, well, gee, shall I do that? No, you're not gonna do that. So <laughs> then you turn it around. Now that, so you, I don't know what you do here. You just, you, you don't want to probably make a line here parallel to this. You want to maybe go this way somehow. Um, now there are no curved lines, there's sort of a curve, but there are no circles. Do you want to, do you want to make a circular thing like that? Now that's sort of, then what do you, then if you come down here, look, you're in trouble, or I'm in trouble, or somebody's in trouble, because look, what is this going to, do you see already some sort of a shape developing here like this that, that's, that's a very heavy commitment for that area to make something like that. That's a, right, what do you, do you know what I'm saying or not? Or, yeah. that's, a, that's a big, that's a big space commitment, right? What, what the hell are you going to do with that thing? So, I don't know what I, well, well I'll, I'll come back to that. I don't know what I'm going to do with that. Uh, now, the question is, why does anybody make anything at all? Poetry or plays or, you know, paintings or sculpture. Why does anybody make anything? And that's a difficult question. It might be that the person is discontented with the world that he or she lives in and feels at least I can make something that, albeit small, I can make something that is somewhat the way I want it to be, not perfectly. I can't make it perfectly, but I can sort of, you know, they asked an artist, what's the best picture you ever made? He said, the next one. The next one is the best one. So you can't make a picture that says it all or does it all, because you wouldn't go on. Um, but I think it's the idea that you have some degree of control over something, and you're limited by your ability. You're limited by your talent. And when I was thinking about this talk, I thought of three things, talent, Talent is sometimes called a gift, and I thought about that a lot. What does that mean? That means that the person who receives or has the talent, it was given to him or her. It's nothing you earned. The greatest artists of all time were born with that talent. Now the question is, what do you do with the talent that you were born with? That's a totally different story. Do you make anything of it or do you not? 
That's, but when I was in graduate school one day and somebody ran in the door, the teacher was lecturing us and this guy ran in the door and said, you know, wash a dog, dry a dog, it's still a dog. And, I, and then he said, the corollary to that is no matter how high a rat can jump, still a rat. And he ran out the door and I thought, what the hell, what was that? So, no ma you cannot make something greater than your own talent, right? You just can't do that. But the question is, what do you do with the talent that you were, through no fault of your own, you have or don't have? You know, if you have some talent, some little talent, what do you make up? What do you, how well do you develop it? Then I thought about curiosity. I, I have, if I'm, we wanna have some time to have questions. I have a son who, uh, we have a son who uh, runs a program in Harlem, after school program for poor kids. He gets about 125 kids in there every day and he tutors, and I go up there twice a week and tutor these kids with other volunteers and they play squash. And these kids are very, very incurious. They are, they are, there are pictures, a few of my pictures, but other pictures that we put up there. They have no, they never say to me, Mr. Polsky, what, what the hell is that? You know, what's that thing? What's that? They have no, virtually no curiosity. And why don't they have curiosity? Well, I ride the bus when I leave at 116th Street and the mothers are yelling at these kids, shut up! and smack them. Now that is not conducive to becoming curious, that I can guarantee you. And once these kids grow up uncurious, it's very, very hard to make them curious. It's very difficult. And how about imagination? Imagination, the, the caregivers have to tolerate imagination in the young people. Even if they're doing something that you think is really not your way of doing it, or you, you know, have a choice, you, you wouldn't do that. But you have to be somewhat tolerant and say, gee, I never would have thought of that, or I have no interest in doing that. But if little Johnny wants to do that, that's okay. So curiosity and imagination can be stifled in a human being very, very easily, I think, in a young person. Um, let's see. I, I, I said that I think people create things. I make these pictures. I can't tell you why I make these pictures, because it's fun. Or I, I like to see who I am today. I start making a picture. I don't know. We could probably sell. We could probably do something. I don't know. Probably can. Um, who am I today? What am I thinking about? What colors do I like? What, what's the itch on me today that I can't quite scratch? You know that? What, what, what the hell's going on? So you, now these pictures are all related. They're all made by me, uh, but they're all somewhat different. They're not just, you know, exact copies of each other. So I must have felt had a different bee in my bonnet or itch on a given day when I made each one. Um, okay, so the qu people have asked me, how do, you, how do you actually make the pictures? I, the paper is handmade paper, it's made of cotton and it's pulp, you know, if you know anything about paper making, I don't know a lot, you, maybe you know a lot more than I do, but they take rags and they put it in a beater and the, and, the, and the cloth dissolves into a pulp and then they put it on a, on a frame and the water drips out and they press it and all of a sudden it's a beautiful piece of paper. I like, I'm very interested in ambiguity, my life, as, as I think all of our lives are full of ambiguity. I was thinking, 
You sit, you're sitting next to people you may never have known or you're sitting next to people you may have known your whole life, but how well do you really know those people? How much do you even know about yourself, let alone the person that you've lived with for many, many years or think you know very, very well? So I'm interested in the mystery, the ambiguity, the, the, the fact that you can never really get to the bottom of what's going on. It's, it's, it's like life itself, it's just a total mystery. You came from who knows where, you're headed for who knows where. <laughs> what, do, what, do we, you know, what are you doing here? Are you, <laughs> what are you sitting here for? What the, you know, what the hell are we all doing? It's just a, sort of unbelievable if you think about it. So, uh, I like the lines, I make, I, the lines, um, I like lines that are, um, that are, sometimes I make lines that sort of look like they're dragging. I like, I like uh, scratches. I'd like to go in, I haven't done this, but I'd like to go in prison, in prison cells. You know where the prisoners scratch stuff, unknown people, you'll never know them, you'll never know how miserable they were, you'll never know what they were thinking, but there, there are all kinds of scratches and initials and diagrams and who knows what scratched on the wall, the, or contrails from airplanes that fly overhead. Those the pilot probably, doesn't, maybe the pilot sees them, but the, the passengers don't see those contrails from the, from the jets going by. So I'm very interested in in lines that are sort of, I'm not gonna to touch this now, but sort of, they're not, they're not uh, firm. They're sort of, you know, uh, scribbly a little bit, scribbly or scratchy. Um, let's see here. Um, as I said, I like ambiguity very much. You know, you can't, like that picture there, what the hell is that? You, know, you, look, you look at that picture, what is that? I don't know what that is. Huh? Or several other, what is that? I don't know, don't ask me. I, <laughs> I don't know what it is. Uh, um, I like to go through garbage cans and dumpsters. I found one of the most interesting books I was at, my wife and I came out of a movie on Lexington Avenue and there was a garbage can with a lot of books in it. And who can resist diving into a garbage can with a, right? I'm sure there are other garbage cans. You don't have to admit it here, but there's, okay. So I, I got a book and it was the 25th anniversary book, reunion book, from the class of 1940 of Yale. Now, 1940, June, they all went into the service. And this is 25 years later, and they're writing about what their lives were like in the last 25 years. Now, you couldn't, hum, you know, you can't make up some of the stories in that book. And I, it's, I just, uh, I think it's one of the best books I ever found in a garbage can or anywhere else. I mean, it's a very, very interesting book. So I, I like to go look for junk. Um, the um, making art is a very physical manual labor, which if you're worried about getting your hands dirty, you probably wouldn't be comfortable doing it because, I mean, you do get paint on your clothing and you do get paint on the furniture sometimes and you do, do get, paint on your hands and sometimes it takes a while for it to come off. So if that's something that is not for you, that's not for you, you know, or making things with clay. People say, oh, clay, you're playing with, mm. And, uh, <laughs> but if you've ever worked with clay, clay's one of the great things you can work with. It's one of the great materials. I uh, was around some glass blowers for a while and all I wanted to do was touch the molten glass, because have you ever seen molten glass? Every, don't you want to touch it? 
I suppose you'd touch it once and that would be the end of that, but <laughs> I never made things in glass because it really is, is begging you to touch it. But you can't touch it, of course. You could once, I said. Um, okay, now, um, I don't know if there's anything um, that, that I didn't cover that you would like to ask or anything about your own work, yes. Oral? That you, do. you mean the oral histories? Yeah. Did you talk about that about 30 years ago, I had this itch, which I've had my whole life. I wanted to really be an artist, but psychologically, I couldn't do it. I, I, I couldn't do it. So I thought, gee, maybe if I talk to people who have had artistic careers, by osmosis, I can get some of that in me. Of course, that's stupid, but I... I so I did, I did 200 oral history interviews with some very good artists and craftspeople, and I started by asking them, tell me about your childhood. Tell me about your mother and father. Tell me how you were treated as a kid. Did you have trouble expressing your artistic interests? Were, you, were your caregivers sympathetic to your interests? Did, how did you fare when you were growing up? Were you considered the odd kid or just tell me about it? And I heard all the stories from these people and then they went on to, many of them went to art school and they had great uh, successes as artists. I interviewed a fair number of people at RISD. Uh, but that didn't help me. It didn't do for me, I mean it was a great, a great service to the oral history collection at Columbia University. They have the largest oral history collection in the, maybe in the world, but not just of artists, but of all different kinds of people. And I gave the interviews to uh, Columbia. But it didn't, it didn't, I had to work it out for myself. I had to reach the point where I was, make a few little baby steps and see if I could make something. It wasn't, I don't know what it was exactly. It wasn't so much that I didn't think I could make something or that what I made wasn't good. First of all, what the hell does that mean it isn't good? Yeah. Well, what is that? It has no meaning. If you make it and you like it, that's good. <laughs> and if you make it and somebody else likes it and you don't like it, does that make it good? No. <laughs> right? You can't. Did you ever find a young person, your own age, a woman or a man, and you brought them home and your folks said, whoa, whoa, whoa. there, there is, there is a lovely young person. There, there, is, there is beautiful or handsome or great potential. And you thought to yourself, gee, my folks think great potential, really beautiful. And you hugged and you kissed, but it just didn't have it, right? It, do you know what I'm saying? It just didn't, everything looked good on paper, on the charts, it just doesn't have it. And if it doesn't have it, you can hit your head against the wall for three hours, it ain't gonna have it, right? And a picture that doesn't have it, well, you turn it around, you say, well, maybe if I look at it, wash a dog, dry a dog, still a dog, right? No matter, no matter how you try to, do it. If it doesn't have it, it doesn't have it. So some of these pictures, uh, I think, look better than others. I'm not telling which ones, but I, <laughs> I, uh, any other questions? Yes. Um, so you talked about your childhood and your family not being Yes, creative. yes. Did you still make art as a child or did you hide it? I lighted a lot of fires in the neighborhood. <laughs> what? 
I lighted a lot of fires in the neighborhood. I didn't get a lot of credit for that. <laughs> and they didn't know I was doing that. But I made, I made some clunky little ceramic dishes. And I remember standing at the top of the cellar steps, holding one of those in my hand and saying, can I throw this down the steps and break it into a million pieces? Can I do that? Can I do that? And finally, I threw it down down the steps and it crashed on the cellar floor. So I made a few things, but I would say I was conflicted about it, at, at, to say the best, right? Uh, conflict, yes. I'm not, I know how to read, <laughs> but I'm not a, a good reader. I, I pick, oh, I. Well, yeah, I like looking at pictures. I like, I like pi to look so at pictures. That, it stir that within? Well, you look at pictures that people have made and you think to yourself, I never would have made anything like that. That's the good part, you know? I wouldn't, to think that somebody would think of making something that you never would think of making, I think that's just unbelievable. Well, that's what inspires me about Paul Clay and, and yeah, maybe you. Here because yeah, you wouldn't you wouldn't do that. You, I don't have we don't have a lot of my own pictures up on the wall. I don't want to look at them, especially. I mean, I made them. You know, get real. <laughs> I mean, you get tired. Pardon? You get tired of your own. I don't have much interest in looking at my own work, or looking at myself in the mirror, especially. I don't know. <laughs> yes. You mean which artist do I like? Yeah. Or, or, what, what, or what painting that you found very Well, I like Joseph, we like Joseph Albers' paintings a lot. Um, I like Max Beckman's paintings a lot. I like paintings that I never, you know, I never would do myself. You know, I'm not especially attracted to people who are doing things sort of like I do. I mean, who needs that, right? <laughs> You want to see people who are doing things you never would imagine doing. Or hearing music. Now I listen to, in my studio, I play a lot of music. I play Baroque music almost exclusively, or pre-Baroque. And then I skip all the way up to Philip Glass. And I, I, I'm not a Mozart fan, I'm not a Schubert fan. I, I Haydn, I, I go just about from Bach to Philip Glass. Now don't ask me what that's all about, but... but <laughs> Uh, that's, yes. I'm interested in your methodology. You mentioned, you know, how do I feel today? Well, you don't know how you feel and today. You start a, a, a piece. Do you finish the piece? No. One day? No. Do you go back to it? Do you put it aside? I well. More than one at a time. No, I usually make one one picture at a time. Um, What would you do here? What would you do from, you could make this like that. Then you're really making trouble for yourself. Then, then you've sort of, you see how you've used up this whole section? And there's nothing to go with that so far. So, so this is already a pretty big commitment that I'm not especially happy about. And, I mean, this is probably not, do you want to, I, I don't know what, what the hell you could do here. I mean, it's a mess. I don't know. I don't like all these triangles anyhow. I don't, you know, maybe. Can you change, can you change well, you can't change this stuff. You can't change it. I, I draw on it with a ink or a, or a water, you, you can't change this. This is acrylic paint on the paper, and you, I can't change it, which is sort of fun. It's like your own life. How the hell can you change your life? You're stuck with it. And, well. So you lay it down with the ink first? Yeah, usually I, yeah. Or sometimes I get a uh, hypodermic 
a, a plastic hypodermic thing and I load it with ink and then I sort of s squirt it. And the question is, are you gonna squirt it over the edge? And that's, if you, if you put a border on it. Now this picture here, if you look, I was looking at it before. I had to scrape off some paint there and some paint is still there. You gotta keep it within the borders and if you don't, then you say, it's like chopping something in the kitchen, you cut yourself, oh my God, what am I gonna do, right? What, am, what are you gonna do? You have a real problem, especially if the picture's going fairly well. What are you gonna, yeah? I didn't mean to interrupt you. Um, huh? I was really doing that. Uh, I was wondering how you settled on your palettes for the next season. Well, you go to the art supply store. <laughs> I'm serious. And they have, I use powdered pigment. And you look at all these colors and you say, hmm, that, I don't have that one, I wonder. And I like to make things as difficult as I can for myself. <laughs> if you make things easy for yourself, what the hell do you have, right? I don't mean you should marry somebody you can't stand, but, <laughs> I mean, that happens too, right? But, <laughs> uh, but I try to really, it's like walking a tightrope. It's no fun if you, if you don't feel you're gonna maybe fall off, and, right? So, the, so I go to the store and I say, this, this color, no, not that one. This color, see that brownish color? I, I had never used that. You don't see a lot of that in a lot of, and I found that and I said, gee, that looks like sort of an interesting color. And I mixed it up and it's two things. It's very flat, I like, I like it because it's flat, and it's opaque, and the color itself I think is terrific. So I thought, wow, I discovered, I don't know what you call it, olive drab khaki, I don't know, who, care, who cares what you call it, right? I thought that's a terrific color. So then you think to yourself, what color can I really give it the needle with without making it jump over out of the car. What can I push that color with a little bit? How can I make it difficult? And what would be an easy, yellow next to it, you know, a nice yellow might, but that's no fun. It's no fun if you, if you make it easy for yourself. Yes? Pardon? I started painting on canvas with oil paint. And it takes so long to dry. I'm sort of impatient. And this paint dries within five minutes. I used to make um, flies for fly fishing. And, and you make, do you, do you, I don't know if there are any fly tires here. You make one, it's all right. You make another one. First of all, you have to have the exact feather from the neck of a cock that comes from Indonesia or something. <laughs> the thing's floating by the fish 30 miles an hour. Do you think the fish says, oh, that's, a f that's made out of plastic? I'm not. So you find out what you, find out what you like. I couldn't tie, I tied one fly, I tied two, and I thought, to hell with it, I'm, I'm not gonna spend my time going cutting and all that little, I used to make jewelry. How, how many jewelry makers do we have here? All right, you know what jewelry requires? A lot of filing and filing and filing and buffing. And if, you'd fi if you're thinking about something else, all of a sudden you filed it too far, it doesn't fit, you gotta start to hell with that. I'm, that's not my temperament. So the oil painting, it takes a long time to dry. And I'll tell you something else, on a canvas, it has give to it. I don't want that. I, I put these up on the wall with push pins and it's very solid. And when I work on it, it's not f fighting me, you know? It's not resisting and bulging in and bulging out. So, yes? Oh. Do you know what resist is? Remember when you make tie-dye stuff, you have something that the, that the paint resists? 
Well, there's something called frisket, which is like rubber cement. So I get a, uh, um, this picture here. Can you see this picture? Yeah. This, I, I get a syringe and I load it up with this like rubber cement. And you, then I squeeze it where all that white, every white line, right? Then I go around the edges of the frisket with my color, my green. And then when it's all dry, that picture is the same thing. Now, this unfortunately, ripped, some of the paper ripped off here. I, ideally, I think that line's a little too fat, and this is a little, you know, not ideal. But you, then you rub the frisket off with your finger, and it's like rubber. And where you paint, the paint's not going to adhere where that frisket is. It, it, it blocks out the paint. And then when you peel it off, voila, hey, look, a painting, right? I mean, that's, that's what that is. And sometimes some of the paper comes off, too. And it looks good sometimes, sometimes it does. Thank you. Uh -huh. Yes. Uh, Richard, uh, first of all, thank you so much for being here. Uh, my name is Tom Swift. Uh, Joni and I are great supporters of this place. And they are so fortunate to get somebody like you to come here. Um, we're so excited about your work that we actually bought one of your mm -hmm. pieces the thank first you. night. Uh, and we're very excited about that. And thank you for being here tonight. Mm -hmm. um, but thank you. You know, you, you, you help generate the enthusiasm for art in this small community, and it's an elaborate one, um, but thank you so much for, you spent a lot of time thinking about what made sense to talk to us about. Well, thank uh, you for inviting me. Well, that was fantastic. <laughs> uh, well, that's my first point, thank you. But second, you know, I think uh, the Art Center, Lisa and everybody, you know, let's give them a hand to bring this in here and have this happen. Uh, this art center, where was it? Three years ago. This was a garage. <laughs> Thank you for being part of it tonight. Thank you all very much. Yes. So we have a couple of pieces in here that are from the 1970s. Were you painting this entire time, or did you have times when you were not making making paintings, making pictures? <sighs> Most of my life I didn't make pictures. When did well, you start? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, don't, I'm, I don't know. 70s, maybe? I, I don't know. Do what? Do you remember the day? Do you have times when he wasn't? Making work, or was it always? Well, do you mean doodles? You don't mean that. I don't know. I, I had a long time, as I said, I couldn't do it. I just was, psychologically, I wasn't strong enough to do it. I mean, it's not a great admission, but it's the truth. And those of you who have dreams that you can't fulfill, maybe you will, maybe you won't, right? I mean, nobody knows what, if it, it's nice if you are able to, if you are, if you have something that you love or you think you love, that you're finally able to give it a try and it may lead to something else. You know, who was it? One of the famous Nobel scientists said, it's exceedingly hard to make accurate predictions, especially about the future. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes. You, you have to make, you have to start, right? Yeah, yeah. You just stand there, as I said, you can stand there forever. Or, and, you know, the, these, that, those pieces of paper cost 110 or 15 dollars each piece. So when you're standing there in front of that piece of paper, and the paper, even without any picture on it, is a work of art. I mean, though, though, that paper is really beautiful, a beautiful object. So what are you gonna do? Either you turn your back and walk away, or you say, to hell with it. I only live once, so I'm gonna do my best. And isn't that it? Or, or not, or you don't have to. 
You might say that paper is so beautiful, I, I'm not, I can't do anything. Then, then that's it. You do. Um, <laughs> well, well, if you use nice material, like you can use less fancy paint too. But what is it? It's mostly water. Then you you want to you have a beautiful you you like blue and you go to your blue and it looks terrible. What what the hell? It's hard enough succeeding without tying, you know, without blindfolding yourself. Let's give us a fighting chance. We don't, we don't always do so well, but let's you not. Paper that you really love, that well, yeah, this paper is, you know, touch the, touch the piece of paper. Well, you, I see it, I see it, I see the quality of the colors are going back. And they're almost like icons or something. They have that. Yeah, they're, they're, and that's because the paper holds the paint very well. It doesn't soak in and get all dull, you know. Is it, is it a hot press paper? Pardon? Is it a hot press paper? No, I don't think it is. There's somebody here. It's not hot press paper. I don't think so. But was that trial and error that um, method that you came up with the relief of the, um, using the rubber cement? Yeah, you go to an art supply store. I said, what the hell's that stuff there? She says, well, that's, that's frisket. I said, what, the, what is that? I didn't go to a fancy art school, as I told you. I said, what the hell's that? She said, well, you put it on, it dries, you, and you peel it off. And I said, well, then you paint around it, and you peel it off, and then you get those lines. She said, yeah, that. So if you don't drop it on the rug or something like that, you're all set. Or get it on your clothes, you don't get it out. Do any of your works have titles? No. Oh, yes, a few do. And a few things. Not. And they're all in German for some reason, because <laughs> I don't speak German. And, and you don't speak German. But I like German. I think I, I, I it's a, somebody said German's a Lego language. You take a root and you just add different prefixes and suffixes to it. And, so I have one I called the impregnator. It looked like uh, somebody impregnating a woman. It's not here. And, uh, oh, I can tell you. I mean, have you heard enough? Yeah, you try. I'll tell you one more story. One time during my sleepless, sleepless nights, I thought, you know what would make a beautiful series of prints is it contraceptive diaphragm. Now, I don't know why I thought that, but I thought, so I woke up and I said, I'm gonna try and make a series of prints using contraceptive diaphragms. So the first job in New York State is to get a prescription for, okay. for diaphragms. So where the hell was I gonna get a prescription for diaphragm? So a sort of a relative had gone to medical school and her roommate was a gynecologist. So I said, I need a prescription for some contraceptive diaphragm. So she said, well, I'll ask my ex-roommate. So she didn't, she said, yeah, you can call her. She'll give you a prescription. So I called her up and I said, how many different size diaphragms do you, I, it's a crazy story, it's a true story. How many different size diaphragms do you have, you know, do you give to people? She says, well, let me look at my chart. She says, five, five sizes. I said, can you write me five prescriptions <laughs> for, those, for those diaphragms? So she sent them to, and I said, I'll, I'll give you a copy of the print in the event that it turns out to be anything. So I got the five prescriptions and I went to a, a place on uh, Falk, Falk uh, uh, Pharmacy on, where is it, 72nd Street? Yeah, and I waited in line and I got very nervous as I got closer and closer. <laughs> and I thought, well, I have this idea and, and I'm this far, you know. So I got up to the, to the, to the, 
guy and, and, uh, and I said, I'd like you to fill these prescriptions for me. And he looked at me and he looked at them. He said, uh, what do you use these for? <laughs> and you know what I was about to tell him and I thought, no, don't say that. Uh, you're this close, you know, don't. He said, well, what do you want these for? And I, was, I wasn't happy, you know, I was nervous and I wasn't. And I said, oh, it's an art project. Oh, he said, an art project. He said, all right, I'll send them over. So he sent them over and I made ultimately photogravures, the most beautiful photogravures of these of these diaphragms, each, five of them, and each one is, the diaphragm itself is about this big, the, the paper, they are so subtle, so beautiful. And I made a portfolio, I, they're not, I didn't send them or bring them or anything, but they are really beautiful. So sometimes you have an idea that works out, you know, in the middle of the night you think of something that, and it works out, and most of the time it doesn't work out at all, but that's, 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 that's the end of that story. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you so much. Alex. Exactly. Thank you. That's what I was going to say. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you enormously. Thank you all. Uh, I think this could go on all night long. Probably could. <laughs> A lot more, lot more stories, I'll tell you. Thanks so much, everybody, for coming.